Good morning, and welcome to Comics for Breakfast. I'm your host, Jason Mink, and as you can see, Spider-Man Month continues. Last week, we looked at the origin of everyone's favorite wall crawler, along with the epic Spider-Man vs. the Sinister Six story from The Amazing Spider-Man Annual Number 1. It was there our hero tackled not one, but six of his legendary foes in a battle that would set the standard for stories to come. We're going to jump forward from that astonishing first annual all the way up to another notable issue, Amazing Spider-Man number 100. Ah, but first, a little bit of background. While well, several of Spidey's most iconic villains had already been introduced, creators Stan Lee and Steve Ditko hadn't been resting on their laurels. Readers would thrill to the introduction of the Crime Master, the Scorpion, and the Molten Man, along with the Rhino, the Shocker, and, most devastatingly of all, Wilson Fisk, the Kingpin of Crime. But it wasn't just villains that made the scene, but important supporting characters like Harry Osborn, Robbie Robertson, and Captain George Stacy, along with Peter's vivacious next-door neighbor and future wife Mary Jane Watson, and then-current love Gwen Stacy. Struggling to juggle his dual lives, Peter has recently survived yet another conflict with his deadly archenemy, the Green Goblin. Exhausted by the constant string of battles and frustrated by his inability to have a normal relationship with Gwen, Peter finds himself at a crossroads. High above the city, Spider-Man talks to himself. Hey, there's no one else up there. The sound of gunfire attracts his attention, and Spidey drops in to investigate. It's a gang of bank robbers, and, after a little patty cake, they take off in their getaway car, which our hero stops in his own inimitable fashion. After the cops make the scene, Spidey lights out of there, eager to be on the move. Even nabbing bad guys has lost its luster. The webhead is in a funk. Second-guessing the whole alter-ego thing, Spidey drops to a nearby rooftop and changes to Peter Parker. Girlfriend Gwen is on his mind, but the recent death of her father and the possible implication of Spider-Man for the act has complicated things for the couple. But what if there was no Spider-Man? Turns out, in his spare time, Peter's been working on a serum to nullify his unique powers— then he could live a normal life with the woman he loves, free of the enemies that he's made over the years. And before you could say, have a coke and a smile, the kid quaffs his untested potion with unsurprising results. After this spectacular Gil Kane nostril shot, Peter passes out but is tormented by his now fevered subconsciousness. He thinks of his Aunt May and his guilt over the death of Uncle Ben, of one-time girlfriend Betty Brant, now in the arms of another man, and of his own sweet Gwen, shattered by recent events. Now inexplicably outside, Peter as Spider-Man is haunted by a distant but insistent calling. However, before he can reach its source, he's attacked by the vengeful vulture who knocks him off the roof for his trouble. Unfazed, Webhead manages to nab his foe with a web line, knocking him out with a haymaker. Before he can dwell on it, our hero is struck by a body-shaking blow. It's Dr. Kurt Connors, once again transformed into the loathsome lizard. A judicious use of web fluid binds the raging beast, who Spidey then rides, urban cowboy style, into a nearby chimney. Still haunted by the voice, our hero moves on, leaving the lizard to presumably suffocate. A familiar explosion behind Spider-Man signals the arrival of the Green Goblin, who should still be recovering from a beating two issues previous. 
He tosses some knowing insults Webhead's way, a pattern all of the villains have thus far exhibited, extensions of Spider-Man's own doubts and fears. And Spidey's clearly had enough of it. Dispatching the goblin, he moves again towards the ever-insistent voice, a burning in his side, in spite of not having been injured there. And hey, here's Doc Ock doing his John Travolta dance. The wall crawler ain't having it. We all know Disco is dead. Drawing closer to the still beckoning voice, our hero takes a blow to the solar plexus, courtesy of the kingpin, but Spider-Man drops him like a bag of dirty laundry. The pain in his side now maddening as the voice in his head, Spider-Man is confronted by a vision of George Stacy, the police captain he'd proven unable to save. But he's dead! <laughs> yeah, but you know how it is. These guys always come back for a pep talk, and the captain is no exception, telling Peter to quit running and accept who and what he is. And that's all well and good, but what is Peter now? As Johnny would say, weird, wild stuff. This unexpected transformation proved to be more than just a shock ending for many readers who took issue with such a narrative departure. Over the past few years, the Amazing Spider-Man title had matured into more than just standard superhero fare, with just as much focus being placed on character interactions and relationships. For the title to suddenly take a hard left into what seemed like pure fantasy proved to be a harsh disconnect for some longtime readers, while others decided to stick around and see what would happen next. They didn't have to wait for long. Looks like the potion Peter whipped up to remove his alter ego's powers wasn't quite ready for use. Stunned, our hero grapples with the additional four arms he sprouted, noting they've made him even more like a spider than ever. And while the next concern of any sensible person would be, do I now shoot webs out of my butt? Peter is more worried about his new limbs, which he waves about to wonderful comedic effect. A call from Gwen leads Peter to spin another lie, a web of deceit neither may escape from. But Peter has bigger problems. Where's he going to shop for shirts now that he has four extra arms? And what will Aunt May think? It's looking grim, but another call breaks his reverie. It's Robbie Robertson, news editor of the Daily Bugle, offering the photog a gig, but Peter is forced to decline due to his unexpected condition. Feeling sorry for himself, Peter decides the best thing to do is get out of the city for a while, and he knows just the guy to call. Dr. Kurt Connors is surprised to hear from Spider-Man, but, grateful for the hero's help in the past, offers the use of his vacation home on Long Island. Quickly packing, Spidey swings out of there for his destination, but coordinating his new limbs proves to be more problematic than expected. Hopping a train, Spider-Man soon arrives at his destination, an isolated manor on a lonely beach. Even before entering the place, our hero Spider-Sense is buzzing. But why? For our answer, we must move just a mile off the coast to where a ship sits, anchored. On deck, the crew discover the ship's captain has died in the night, presumably the work of the passenger in the ship's hold. Deciding it's time for a little retribution, the crew head into the ship and attack their common enemy. However, in spite of their numbers, the men have underestimated their guest, who bounces the crew around the cabin like beach balls before escaping. The stranger evades capture, and the crew assume he's fallen off the ship, a mistake they will live to regret. Come nightfall, the thing called Morbius rises, stalking and killing the crew to sate its unquenchable bloodlust. So where do you find the outfit? Is the ship's cargo hold full of Ziggy Stardust-style vampire outfits, or what? This is a question left for another time, as the sun is up and even living vampires don't go for that. Morbius takes shelter in the Connor's house, ignorant of the Spider-Man toiling in the basement laboratory. Unfortunately, our hero has thus far been unable to formulate a cure, leading to this outburst. Distracted, Spidey doesn't notice Morbius, who attacks his unknowing prey. Shaken from his reverie, Spidey fights back. He's shocked by his foe's weird appearance, but assumes he's just another costume villain trying to make his bones, and knocks him across the room for his trouble. However, Morbius instantly recovers, going for the wall crawler's throat. 
Unable to compensate for his foe's raw power, our hero is thrown over a nearby balcony. Knocked unconscious from the impact, Morbius drops on the sprawled Spider-Man, preparing to feed. It is then Dr. Kurt Connor steps into the house, shocking the living vampire with his appearance. Morbius swoops in, but with a speed unexpected for his frail frame, the Doc ducks his attack. And wouldn't you just know it, the stress of finding a vampire in his beach house turns the poor guy into the lizard again. Damned inconvenient, if you ask me. Morbius was an interesting choice to launch from a title like Amazing Spider-Man. I mean, Old Webhead wasn't exactly known for mixing it up with supernatural characters. That would come later. At this point, the weirdest thing Spidey had encountered was the lizard. So it was a bit of a surprise to longtime readers who were scratching their heads over his new eight-armed appearance and his vampiric adversary. What would Aunt May think? But enough of my balloon juice. Let's get to that thrilling third act. Our story continues with a stunned Spider-Man staggered between two savage foes. The reader is treated to a quick flashback of how all this has come to be an impressive feat in the space of a single page. The lizard, however, isn't one for recaps and attacks Morbius. Turns out, if anyone is going to kill Spider-Man, it's going to be him. The two go at it, evenly matched in spite of their radical differences. Morbius's hunger is easily countered by the lizard's savagery, the two creatures growing more violent by the moment. Spidey can only watch as the two tear through the lab, wrecking everything in sight. A chance blow sees the lizard thrown into an electrical console, the powerful charge knocking him unconscious. Still hungry, Morbius decides one meal is as good as another and takes a bite out of the lizard, who he later confirmed does in fact taste like chicken. Before he can really dig in, Spidey steps to booting the vampire from his reptilian respite. This has the unforeseen effect of making Webhead Morby's number one meal choice again, but some quick thinking questions from Spidey drive the living vampire off. Things are far from rosy, as the lizard has awoken. Instead of the savage beast, it's the muddled consciousness of Doc Connors that rises to the surface, a first for the character. Turns out the bite of Morbius has had unexpected consequences. And they don't stop there. The lizard begins to revert to his human form, but stops mid-transformation. It's going to be hard to explain to the wife. He and Spidey theorize this might be a cure for Webhead's extra arm problem and get to work. They fart around doing sciencey stuff for an entire page before hitting on the idea of isolating enzymes or some such. As the lizard has grown too bestial and agitated to mix a decent drink, Spidey whips up the stuff for him, and the pair head out in search of their vampiric prey, the name Morbius nagging at Connors. In a nearby town, Morbius seeks shelter from the coming daylight, and readers are treated to an extended origin, courtesy of Marvel's recent jump to larger size quarter price comics. Weeks before, in a hidden laboratory high in the hills of some unnamed European country, Dr. Michael Morbius finishes the research phase of his latest discovery. He assures his reticent assistant Nikos that all is well, but the arrival of Morbius's girlfriend, Martine, puts this statement to the test. She can tell when something's up, and Morbius acknowledges that, yes, he must leave this place for the next step in his work. Being the dedicated type, Martine insists upon joining the two men, in spite of Morby's protests. Booking passage on a freighter to England, the trio then board their own private vessel to perform the sensitive work. It is there Morbius reprimands assistant Nikos for his loose tongue. Martine mustn't know about the fatal disease killing Morbius or their desperate attempts to find a cure via the blood of vampire bats. Probably because she'd laugh so hard you who would come out of her nose. I mean, it's pretty stupid as far as plans go, but hey, I'm no hematologist. The next day it's go time, and Morby bids Martine a nostrally good night before retiring below deck. It's there Nikos has the machine all revved up, the device's special function to create new blood cells using electricity. 
Sure, why not? The button pushed Morbius's cells are bombarded with experimental energy, transforming the scientist into... What? Moments later, assistant Nikos learns the spine-shattering truth. His friend has been transformed into a hollow-eyed beast with a taste for blood. Human blood. Thoughts of the beautiful and potentially delicious Martine smoldering in his mind, Morbius throws himself from the ship with the intention of drowning. However, his survival instinct proves stronger, and he soon brought aboard the supply ship from issue 101. That brings us up to speed, and hey, here's a guy. It's Charlie the Bum, and he hates hippies. Who doesn't? He makes for a fine appetizer, though. Elsewhere, two men in a small newspaper office talk about the weird reports they've been receiving of a six-armed man with a tail swinging through town. It's only Spidey and the Lizard. And you thought giving your grandkids piggyback rides was tough on the lumbar. The Lizard's aggressive personality surfaces and he turns on Spider-Man, who's forced to catch the falling scientist. They've got to find Morbius, and fast, or Doc will lose control of his reptilian alter ego completely. And let's take a moment to admire artist Gil Kane's take on the character, who's never looked so primal or savage. Back in New York, we touch base with a broken-hearted Gwen who deduces Peter might be staying with his Aunt May. However, Peter is not there, convincing the young woman she's been lied to. Across town, talk of the Long Island Phantom has reached the offices of J. Jonah Jameson, but we learn the publisher of the Daily Bugle has bigger fish to fry. Back to the action. High above the street, Morbius is poised to strike another victim when the unexpected occurs. He's been found. In tandem, Spider-Man and the Lizard attack, a formidable team, all things considered. Knowing he's outnumbered, Morbi attempts to flee, but Spidey snags him with a web line, dragging him back to the rooftop. Knocked out, the Lizard quickly moves to draw blood from his fallen foe. The fluid in the vial turns blue, indicating a successful result, and Liz pounds a vein full. Almost instantly, he reverts to his human alter ego, the shock, which makes him susceptible to the living vampire's next move. Morbius seizes the serum and takes off, certain he's found a cure for his own condition. Spidey can only give chase, pursuing his prey across the rapidly dwindling skyline. Morbius is aimed for the sea, where Spider-Man will be unable to follow. Desperate, our hero fires a web line. Catching the fleeing creature, Spidey is dragged erratically, with Morbius abruptly dipping towards the water in a bid to shake him off. However, he doesn't see an oncoming bridge, leaving this wily coyote-esque moment. The two combatants are separated by the impact, with Morbius dropping into the river. Spidey fires another web line at Morby's thrashing hand, but it quickly pulls free, leaving only the vial behind. Exhausted, Spidey returns to where he's left Doc Connors, who administers the serum to the battered webhead. After a Manos moment, Spidey snaps too, back to normal once more. And just in time, huh? The comic's over. Whew. Pretty exhilarating, huh? Okay, so it wasn't everybody's cup of tea. Many readers would have preferred the return of Kingpin, or perhaps more Doc Ock. Part of Spider-Man's appeal was, in spite of the fantastic premise, his adventures were more or less set in the real world. To suddenly have a fan favorite like Spidey running around looking like a Mad Magazine parody of himself was jarring, and readers made their displeasure known. However, it wasn't in time to stop a two-part journey to the Savage Land, where Spidey would fight Craven and his domesticated alien. Ah, but that's a tale for another time. Love it or hate it, Eight-Armed Spider-Man eventually became a thing. The character would return on the Fox Saturday animated morning cartoon, eventually metamorphosizing it to the Man-Spider. My friend Susan found this concept ludicrous, an idea that I underscored by giving her this action figure one year on a Christmas visit. And while Susan is no longer with us, I still have fond memories of both she and this version of Spider-Man.
It wouldn't be long before things were back to normal, but for a handful of issues, readers were lucky enough to experience a different sort of Marvel tale, for good or ill. Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode, please amplify by posting on Facebook, TikTok, or the social media platform of your choice, or grinding towards 1,000 subs so every view helps. I'm Jason Mink, and I'll see you next Sunday at breakfast.